Hello and welcome back to Azure Terraformer. This is the day that you've all been waiting for. Now, whether today will bring you overwhelming joy or a sudden onrush of dread, that's between you and yourself. However, for most of us, the release of the 4.0 version of the Azure RM Terraform provider is good tidings indeed. The last major release, 3.0, was born on March 24th, 2022. And at the time, it boasted 761 resources and 238 data sources, and things were good. But now we sit on the precipice of a new Azure RM 4.0 that boasts a whopping 1,101 resources and 358 data sources. In addition, two provider-specific functions, which we'll go into a little bit later. But yeah, the Azure RM provider has come a long way, and it has never been a better time to be an Azure Terraformer. With the Azure RM provider getting more mature every day, the AZ API provider filling the gaps, new Microsoft providers complementing the ecosystem, yes, I'd say it is a good time to be an Azure Terraformer. So in this video, I wanted to give a quick peek on what's in the 4.0 version of the Azure RM provider, what I'm excited about, and then I'll close out with some words of advice for those looking to upgrade production systems to the new 4.0 version of the provider. So let's get started. Well, of course, the big news is we now have provider-specific functions, two of them, I might add. Uh, one, which is the one that I tried to take on myself before I realized that the entire plugin framework had to be upgraded, and that is the parse resource ID function. Might be interesting to go compare my code to see what code was actually pushed by the authors of the upgrade. Although I suffer no delusions of grandeur that my code is gonna be anywhere near as nice as, uh, as the actual code that shipped. But this function, basically you pass in a fully qualified Azure resource ID, which we all know and love. Azure has one of the most structured and well-organized unique identifier mechanisms, albeit a little long-winded. They do provide really nice breadcrumbs to really understand the topology of the resource and where it lives. You got the subscription ID section, you got the resource group section, you got the resource provider section, and then sub resources from there. And almost every Azure RM resource will output an ID. And when you're stitching resources together using the Azure RM provider, oftentimes you need to reference other resources IDs. But sometimes you actually need a little piece of that ID for other reasons. You know, maybe, maybe some some attributes just need the name of a resource or just need um, the resource group or things like that. So in those cases, we had to drop into string manipulation in order to extract the value from this fully qualified URI. And things get a little bit messy. So with this parse resource ID function, it should make our code a lot cleaner because we can pull, we can pass in an ID, we can pull out the part that we want um, without having to do, drop into any crazy string concatenation or string manipulation. So. Very, very nice. Another, another function is the normalized resource ID, which takes in a resource ID and outputs a resource ID that has proper capitalization. Now, this is a problem that I ran into many, many years ago, but it's been a while since I've run into this. But of course, I do see people popping up on Reddit from time to time still complaining about this issue. And that's essentially like um, occasionally when you provision a resource, all lowercase, Occasionally, ARM will come back and say, boom, this is, uh, this is all caps. And then Terraform gets confused because thing resource names are case sensitive. So Terraform thinks that they're two different resources. Not a great day. Uh, but I haven't been seeing this very often. So let me, know if, uh, let me know in the comments below if you guys have been seeing this recently. But I, I haven't, personally. But still, it is nice to know that we now have a function that can help us kind of eradicate this issue. Um, if this still does crop up from time to time. I think this is a control plane issue, either the RPs themselves or the control plane returning things in incorrect capitalization. But um, again, I, I, I think this has been sorted out for, for a while now. So hopefully, hopefully you guys don't see that happen very much anymore. Another big thing that's changed is the way that RPs or resource providers are registered by the Terraform provider. Previously, um, the, the Azure RM provider would register kind of the most common ones uh, that the average user is going to run into. And if you're using any, anything more exotic, you'd have to register it yourself. Um, now, many organizations actually have their own 
school of thought about how to manage RPs within a given subscription. And many have opted to lock down subscriptions and only enable RPs if they're actually being used, which makes a lot of sense from a security standpoint, from a cost management standpoint. Um, you don't have people accidentally provisioning resources that they don't, they don't need to touch, um, which makes, makes good, good sense from an enterprise governance standpoint. So now when you register the Azure RM provider, you can set up the way that you want to register Azure resource providers. And there are a few different modes. There's core and extended, which are gonna register a subset of the RPs that are probably most commonly used by the average Azure um, Terraformer. But then there's also all, which I guess is the easy button to make it all go away, but also opens you up to provisioning completely rando resources that you probably don't wanna to be touching, probably shouldn't be touching. Probably don't want to use that one, just, just saying. Um, and then none, which basically is the roll your own 100% efficiency mode where you have to explicitly request for specific providers um, that you are going to be using. So it really makes you think about what RPs that you want to be using within your solution, which I think makes a lot of sense, but does require kind of next level discipline, um, you know, in order to set it up. So probably good if you're in an enterprise environment, but if you're just kind of kicking the tires in a non-prod dev kind of scenario, um, you probably your time's probably better spent elsewhere. Also, apparently, people have been setting up the Azure RM provider without specifying a subscription ID. Now, I suppose if you're using the Azure RM provider to provision management groups and things like that, this would make sense um, because you're not provisioning management groups within the scope of a subscription. Uh, but most resources are provisioned within a subscription and also within a resource group that's in a subscription. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, me personally, I always supply a subscription ID anyway. Uh, so this really doesn't affect me that much, but, uh, yeah, the subscription ID is now a mandatory field. Um, so you can't do what you used to be doing anymore. Um, so if you did that, don't do that anymore. And if you're like me and you did that anyway, keep doing that. Now, me personally, I, as many of you may know, you know, with my book, Mastering Terraform, I do have a lot of experience with other Terraform providers like AWS and Google Cloud. And honestly, one of the nice things that I like about the Google Cloud provider is that it allows you to decide what scope you want to be provisioning within. So on Google Cloud, they have a similar construct to our resource group. It's called a Google Cloud project. Um, and you can provision everything within a project. Everything has to be provisioned within a project. Just kind of like in Azure, everything has to be provisioned in a resource group. But with a Google Cloud provider, you don't have to set the project ID on the provider that you set up, which means you can very easily provision across multiple projects in one Terraform root module which means you can very easily provision across multiple Google projects within one root module. You don't have to go through all the shenanigans of um, setting up you know, multiple provider blocks and maintaining which provider block goes where, like you have to do with the Azure RM provider. Now, don't even get me started on AWS. I mean, they even have to specify the region. At least we don't have to do that. But still, um, there are many multi-subscription scenarios that, uh, that do make a lot of sense. And the way that the provider works today, it makes implementing those solutions a little bit more tedious. So much so that oftentimes people will drop into the AZ API provider in order to overcome some of those limitations. So in my opinion, a good feature for version 5.0 of the Azure RM provider would be, let's make the subscription ID actually optional. Um, and let's, let's make it so that I can attach the su subscription ID as an optional parameter um, to any resource. So when I provision a resource group, I should be able to say, this resource group is going into this subscription ID. This resource group is going into this subscription ID. That's pretty much how it works on the Google Cloud provider. I'd like to see it work that way on the Azure RM provider. That's my opinion. Let me know what you think about this in the comments below. There are, of course, two ways to provision subnets in Azure. You can either provision subnets on a virtual network resource itself as a nested block, or you can use an independent resource to provision a subnet outside of the virtual network as its own thing. I prefer the latter. 
because it allows me more flexibility if I want to change the virtual network in the future and even across multiple Terraform root modules. So in practice, I almost always use the dedicated resources when available. Sometimes they're not always available. <coughs> Application gateway. But those of you that are using those nested blocks to provision subnets, um, be aware. There are massive schema changes coming your way um, for those subnet resource, for those subnet nested blocks within your virtual networks. Um, so I would, I would pay attention. If you are a person that provisions subnets in this manner, um, you should pay attention to this because um, it changes pretty, pretty radically in the 4.0 release. There's going to be a lot of new features. Um, a lot of those features are already in the dedicated Azure subnet uh, resources, but they're bringing them to that nested block. So just be aware of that. Also, AKS no longer supports preview mode. So um, this makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, the Azure RM provider is intended for more stable feature sets anyway. If you're doing experimental or preview features, you know, maybe you can drop in using the AZ API provider and then migrate to Azure RM when things have stabilized. But the decision has been made. Only stable versions of AKS are going to be supported in the Azure RM provider's resources. Now we get to breaking changes and removed resources. And there are quite a lot. I'm not going to boil the ocean, but um, many of these resources have been deprecated for a long time and for different reasons. Some of, some of these resources have new, new resource blocks that have been defined that are going to replace the old block. And the old block has just been hanging around there so as not to break people that have been using it and to give people a chance to move on to the new block. That's one condition. Another condition where resources might be removed are if Azure completely retires a service. In that case, it doesn't make sense to have resources to provision a service that we can't provision anymore, so bye-bye. Those are the two main cases where resources are being dropped or removed. A couple notables are the Azure App Service Environment, it's being replaced by the V3. The Azure RM Dashboard, which was a poorly named resource to begin with, like way too, way too general. Um, is now going to be known as the Azure RM Portal Dashboard, which is actually a pretty cool resource. Lets you automate, you know, the the portal experience within Azure. Which I've I've seen, having worked with third party customers, I've seen a lot of really crazy dashboards that are really useful. Um, there's a lot of power in the Azure Portal um, that oftentimes we don't get credit for, um, but it's a pretty cool thing. Like you can go customize and configure it, and uh, you know, give your operators. Um, you know, some, some pretty advanced capabilities just right in the portal without any custom software. Another major change is MariaDB and MySQL. They had these uh, single server versions that are now going to be consolidated into the MySQL Flex version. Um, so they already have a family of resources with the prefix available. It's called Azure RM MySQL Flexible. And so we're seeing a lot of those resources that have been deprecated for a while are finally going away. And you should start using the Azure RM MySQL Flexible family of resources. Likewise with SQL Server, um, this one's been around for a while, but the SQL DB, Azure SQL DB, um, is now under a resource family prefix called Azure RM MS SQL. Again, most of the stuff should not come as a shock. If it does, you should probably RTFM a little bit more often. Um, these, these have been in the works for years. So just a heads up, you know, so that you're aware. Now, what should you do if you want to upgrade to the new version of the provider? Well, first of all, don't. Pause, hit the pause button, pump the brakes. The first thing that you should do is pin the version of your provider in your root modules so that you can make sure that you're not going to be auto upgraded on accident. It's a bad thing. Okay. Two, the next step, when you are ready to upgrade, first look at upgrading the Terraform core executable. You want to make sure you're working on at least 1.0. I think we're up to 1.9 right now. So make sure you're working on a stable version of the Terraform core executable. Otherwise all bets are off. Three, you might want to consider upgrading to a stable version of the 3.0 provider. 3.114 might be a good choice. This is a good bridge version of the 3.0 provider to get you from 3.0 to 4.0. And then lastly, by all means, under no circumstances should you YOLO this into production. Okay. I hope I'm not being Captain Obvious here, but please, please test, 
Test early, test often. Make sure you have a non-production version of your environment being deployed with the 3.0 version of your Terraform code base. And try your upgrade there. Make sure it's an environment you don't care too much about. People aren't going to freak out if it goes down or if you need to delete things, if you need to figure things out. Um, if you don't have such an environment, provision one. That's kind of what Terraform is about. Like you can go provision new environments. It should be pretty easy for you to do that. If it's not, you might have bigger problems. Just whatever you do, make sure you test, 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 and validate before you push to prod. Also, while you're doing your testing, since there are likely gonna be many breaking changes, make sure that you write down a nice, solid runbook with all the operations that you need to perform, whether it's remove, whether it's move, whatever. Make sure you have that procedure in place for your environments, and then test that procedure, right? Run through that runbook, Spin up, spin up a new environment, run through that runbook again to make sure that you didn't miss anything. Because when you do this in production, that's, that's not when you want to discover that you got problems in your runbook. Okay, treat this like a migration. This is not a YOLO moment. Anyways, let me know how it goes. What are you really excited about in the Terraform 4.0 version of the provider? Let me know in the comments below. And as you go through your upgrade process, drop on the Azure Terraform Discord and join the 4.0 upgrade thread where you can share your experiences with other Azure Terraformers going through the same thing. Anyways, that's it for me. Until next time, happy Azure Terraforming 4.0 mode. This is the Azure Terraformer signing off.